Hello, I'm your host, Leonard Duncan. Welcome to a new episode of ATV Talk and Motorsports Podcast. Please join us every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We bring you interviews with industry professionals, live events, live news about the motorsports industry in every episode. Enjoy the show. Whether we are out riding with our friends and family or racing in extreme environments, we all need good tires. That's why I recommend GBC Power Sports Tires, a division of Green Ball Corp. Their products, which include XC Master, Mini Master, and Ground Buster 3, are what leading professionals in the ATV UTV industry are using. You can get your tires at greenballtires.com or find them on Instagram as GBC Tires for further inquiries. Are you looking for the best suspension technology for your sport ATV? Look no further than Elka Suspension, the industry leader in sport ATV suspension technology. With championship wins in prestigious events such as the Dakar Rally, SCORE, Best in the Desert, ATV MX, Cross Country, and Works, Elka Suspension has established itself as the go-to choice for athletes and enthusiasts alike. But they don't just stop at ATVs. They're constantly expanding into new markets, including UTVs, trucks, SUVs, pit bikes, snowmobiles, and more. Their commitment to innovation and quality means they're always looking to improve and adapt so you can enjoy a smooth ride wherever you go. Want to learn more about what Elka Suspension can do for you? Visit their website at elkasuspension.com or give them a call at 450-655-4855. They will always be happy to answer your questions and help you find the perfect suspension solution for your needs. Welcome to DBR Racing Products, the leader in 3D modeling and innovations. Since 2015, they have been revolutionizing the industry, starting with their groundbreaking YFZ450R battery boxes. But they didn't stop there. They have continued to push the boundaries constantly improving their design with each new version. In 2018, they introduced the game-changing Vortex EXO cage, specifically designed to securely hold the Vortex ECU in a safe and sturdy location. This breakthrough innovation ensures your ECU stays protected even in the toughest racing conditions. At DBR, they understand that every detail matters. That's why they also offer an array of essential products to enhance your racing experience. Their spark plug hold downs keep your engine firing at peak performance while their LTR breather boxes ensure optimal ventilation for your machine. Their LT250 engine skid plates are a must have for those seeking unmatched protection. Engineered to shield your engine from impacts and rough terrain. They provide the ultimate defense for your ATV. But that's not all. They've developed ProPeg mounts that allow you to use TRX 450R Nerf bars, giving you greater control and maneuverability on the track. To explore their full range of innovative products and learn more about DBR Racing, visit their website at www.dbratv.com. You can also reach them directly at 507-828-1233. Their knowledgeable team is ready to assist you with any questions or inquiries. DBR Racing Products, where innovation meets performance, unleash the power within you. Julian Hofert, sorry about that. Welcome to ATV Talk. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm awesome. Hey, thank you for giving me some time. I know that uh, you had quite an experience in Vegas to Reno. Um, Wrangle, your your friend and mine, has uh, really said some uh, amazing things about you and uh, thinks that you're one hell of a rider. Oh, that's awesome. He's uh, He's been a huge inspiration to me. You know, him Iron Manning it for the first time in Best in the Desert history in 21. 
after that, it was, it was, that was my goal. That was my, uh, that's, uh, I wanted to live up to that. And, you know, in 22, I, uh, had the opportunity to race, uh, Vegas Torino with a team, uh, Lyle Tonelli. He let me ride his three wheeler and I was able to do about 220 miles of that. And that was a really good learning experience. I had a lot of fun, but I was ready to do it this year on my own to prove to myself, to prove to the world that I could do it. And I, uh, put a lot of time and effort into it, put, you know, every life on hold for two months to prep and build a bike and build myself up and go out and do it. And all the preparation, everything really paid off. And, you know, I know people prep more than I do and go out there and fail. So I'm, I'm very happy to have gotten just to the finish line. I was thrilled with that. Well, the, the story that I get, and you can shore this up is that you stopped in the beginning uh, early on in somewhere in the race and helped another individual. And there might've been more than one. And that lost you a lot of time. And as the race was progressing, you were making up time, bringing yourself closer and closer to the rest of the pack. You may not have known this, but this is the information I was being fed during the race. And they said at some point they they might have calculated you working towards being in the lead. Um, so uh I did stop at mile 52. Uh, I had I was following someone's dust and then a dirt bike passed me at you know, like I was standing still and he went into the dust, and then all of a sudden all I see is a motorcycle coming up through the air and uh uh I, I pull up and he's on the ground and I pull up and stop. And before I can even shut my, my bike off, I can hear him screaming. And, uh, so I, I help him get him in a more comfortable spot and start calling nine one one and talking with them and just making sure he's all there and ended up having to cut his pants open, checking for external and internal bleeding. He seemed to be okay. Um, tried getting a hold of best in the desert, tried getting a hold of Mike Chase crew. We ended up getting a hold of his wife and his brother and his Chase crew. Uh Wrangle was a big help. I was able to get a hold of Wrangle. He called and, and made phone calls and made it happen. And when I left about an hour after stopping, uh Best in the Desert Rescue just pulled up in a truck. And um a uh I was told Mercy Air was 10 minutes out at that point. I've talked to the guy since then, texted back and forth with him. He got out of surgery. He's got a rod and I think four screws in his leg, uh, but he's doing good. He um, he said he showed up to the starting line about an hour late. So he was riding double time to make up time and ended up going home with some hardware, but not the right hardware. Right. Uh, <laughs> after good. that, I had no dust for probably 200 miles. So I was able to ride full speed and uh, that I think was a big help in being able to make up time, having fresh air. And then I started getting passed by trophy trucks later in the day. Uh, that was pretty good because, you know, you make a turn and you look back and there's no rooster of dust following you. You're normally good. I've only had one or two close calls with the trucks um and most of it was they made a clean pass but when they get back on the road it, i'm whited out i can't see nothing and you don't know whether there's another one coming you don't know if you're in its way you don't know if you, if you turn if you're going to be in its way so that was probably the hairiest of it um but uh i, I was trying to you know definitely try to make up time um at one point i came up on another three-wheeler team and uh their bike was sitting off to the side the uh swing arm bolt had backed out and the bike laid over and the swing arm obviously stayed in place so it bent the shock at almost a 90 degree so i pulled over and stopped and uh we ended up hammering the bushings back into the swing arm with a hammer or with a rock that we found and uh you know between me and the and the rider we were able to stand the bike up maneuver it to where we could use that rock to hammer the swing arm bolt back in. I gave him a uh, pair of vice grips and some zip ties, and he was able to lock that swing arm bolt into place and um, uh, zip tight in place. And I told him, all right, you're 15 miles to the next checkpoint. Just 
baby it and check it every two seconds. And when I got to the next pit, I went and told his crew, Hey, you guys need a shock and a swing arm bolt. And, you know, I don't know what else you're going to need, but you need that and the tools. So get that going. And, um, from there I took off and, uh, before the next pit, I got a flat tire and it was right at a road crossing. So I rode up to the road, called my pit crew and not even two minutes later, their pit crew passed me driving to the next pit. They turned around and put me a set of their tires on my bike so I can keep going. That was, uh, Robert McCraw. You know, he was one of the riders for that team. So it was nice that, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't do it for the good karma. I didn't do it to get help, but it was nice that it was reciprocated. And, uh, that's when the day started getting real long because in the next hundred miles, I had three blowouts and then we would have to limp it to the next pit. And then they'd put a set of tires on and then I'd go out, hit another rock, blow a tire and then limp it to the next pit. And then finally got to pit 13 where Wrangle loaned me a set of his tires. He met my crew at 13. He put a set of his tires on and um, I took it to the finish line from there. And about 10 miles from the finish line, I came up on a rider on the last big hill, a dirt bike rider, and he was stuck under his bike and just about out of gas physically. So I, I picked the bike up and I helped him push it to the top of the hill. And then he rode in behind me to the finish line, which he was telling he was telling me later on that I saved his life, which I think he just wanted to die at that point. But he uh I stopped and say I stopped and helped uh, three different people. Um, the three wheeler crew that I that I stopped for, they were telling me that they had thrown in the towel at that point. They were waiting for a Sweep to come through and get their bike, and they ended up finishing. So I, I it was awesome that I could make two people's dream come true. One for mine getting done and finishing and crossing that finish line, and them for in some way helping them cross the finish line so that was very special to me that's a pretty awesome story man you'll be able to tell your grandkids about that one yeah that was a long-winded answer but i figured that's where we're going with it dude i had no idea i mean that's better from your mouth than than the other stories that were good but man uh helping that many different people in, in one race and the best thing about it from the change in the way they do best in the desert, you have a tracker on your machine and they calculate the time when you stop to when you start again and they give that back to you. Yes, I, I was comped all the time and uh, that put me in third place out of the six entries and the four finishes. So uh, I actually found that out two nights ago that I ended up in third and uh, I, I was stoked. I was the cherry on top. I only entered the race just across the finish line and to, to podium was, was uh, icing on the cake for me. Definitely. It just doesn't get much better. Does it? Not too much. I mean, at, at awards being the only iron man that year, I mean, I had trophy truck guys coming up and shaking my hand and, you know, I, I was the cool kid in the room. I was the man and I've never had that before. So that, that was a, a, real cool experience for me being the cool guy in the room of cool guys. You, you know, I've asked uh, David Ham. I think I've asked Wrangle this as well. Do you guys all go to the same counselor? <laughs> that is our counseling going out and riding three wheelers. That's where we get it all out. Oh buddy. You're, I don't know if that's counseling. I really don't. Uh, I haven't rode, rode three wheelers for years, but um, I still have to test them now and again to, you know, for the customer jobs that we do, but you guys are something else. And and not only did you iron man it, you iron man it on an 86 TRX or ATC 250 R 85. Yeah. Excuse me. 85 makes it even worse. An 85 <laughs> ATC 250 R unbelievable. You know, no, I issues. wouldn't want to do it on any other machine. No Sorry. issues. <laughs> um, no issues. Uh, the like I said, the only issue I had was with flat tires, and that was I could have rode a little more careful. I was trying to make up time and beat the dark, and then going into the dark, 
Luckily, uh, Wrangell made me an awesome headlight setup, so I was able to make night and day. But those sharp rocks in the last, you know, hundred miles of the course were were really getting to me. And you know, I uh, like I said, three three blowouts, and then I popped my front tire, but was able to keep enough air in it to cross the finish line. But um, yeah, the the rocks in the last so section of the course were just really really gnarly and um the only other thing i had to do was um they stopped the race course uh when i was in a pit to land a helicopter on the race course and they said you can either stay here or you can ride 10 miles and wait in the sun i said all right i'll stay here and my uh front end uh the front end steer bearings wore a little bit of wear in it and I could just barely feel it clunking and it was really it was messing with my head more than anything else so we took that time to pull a uh, tear into it make that adjustment probably put a, a half a turn on it maybe a little more and it was good to go the rest of the time not one hiccup out of the bike it ran really good which is kind of leading into uh when I crossed the finish line I broke into tears I could barely talk I, um, I was so exhausted. I had been reciting my finish line speech for the last hundred miles. So I was able to spit that out and the rest was just a blur, but I, I there was a lot of people I'd let, I wanted to thank, and I was hoping to use this platform to thank them. That'd be Go okay. Right Go right ahead. And I hope it's no conflict of interest to you, but, uh, I will first, like I said, I wanted to thank Wrangle. He made me an awesome headlight bracket and wiring harness for my lighting that I was able to turn night into day. I have no doubt that I had the best lighting setup out there on for bikes. Um, he also made, he, I bought a Lone Star skid plate and he beefed that up big time. And I'm glad he did because there was, uh, it was destroyed after the race and no way it would have made it without what he did to it. He put a lot of brackets in it and reinforcements and, uh, chain guide and it it really it held up great for as much abuse as I put it through. I also want to thank uh, Paul Belt Racing. He prepped my engine and uh, went over it for me free to make sure I had no issues and I had no issues. It ran great. I was very happy with that. Not one hiccup all day. Um, I want to thank Foothill Side by Side. Um, Matt went through and helped me prep the chassis and go through everything, every nut and bolt. So I had full confidence in the bike. I didn't have to think about nothing. I just go out there and ride at my full potential. About a month before the race, I was going over the bike and I found a major structural crack on the bottom of the uh, frame on by, by the engine, by the motor mount. And uh, I had to strip the bike down to nothing and weld it up. And he opened up his shop to me and his resources and his tools and his knowledge and helped me get that better than ever and strong and it held up great during the race so i'm very grateful for him um brian at san diego small engines he went through and dialed in my suspension i have no doubt that he because of the work he did to my suspension i was able to make it all 521 miles i um i was very happy with it it kept me safe kept me from going over the bars it it saved my butt multiple times uh, Crystal at your mark custom printing. She did my Jersey. She did all my pit gear and she did my fundraiser shirts. She made me a good deal. I can make, I made, was able to make money and raise about $400, $500 from all the people that bought t-shirts to help me get to the race. Um, Ocotillo Brewing Company and Interstate 8 Desert Racers. They paid for my Baja pits. So um, for those of you that don't know what Baja pits are, they uh, are a pit service and they have, they take your fuel jug out to all the remote pits, or if your crew can't make it to a pit in time, they will have fuel for you. They were able to, uh, uh, they have tools and knowledge and welders and help that, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a one man crew, which I was started with, then it's essential. Uh, I want to thank Skeeter and Charisma at Baja Affordable Homes and Thermal Rocks and Dirty Girl Racing. Bobby, Kara, Ike, and Lori at Very Fast Racing, Keith at Nishiyama Racing, Steve Gimby, Razor Sean, and Sodomans Maintenance Service for all your generous contributions. They've all gave, some gave a lot, same gave, you know, as much as they could. And they were able to just give a little bit to make my dream come true. And I really appreciate them for that. 
And uh, last but definitely not least, I want to thank my Chase crew, Crystal, Rob, Carolyn, and my mom, Mary. Uh, Carolyn and Rob are seasoned veterans of racing. They've been in the hot seat. They've done, they've done chasing before. Um, and they're friends with my mom, and they brought my mom out. This is the first desert race my mom has ever seen, and she was able to come out. She went up all the way on every other pit. And uh, it was definitely an experience for her. She made me promise at the end that I'll never do it again. And I told her I'll never do this again till next year. Um, <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. Crystal is my girlfriend. She drove my chase truck. I mean, any dude that lets their girlfriend drive their truck, that's got to be a special woman. She did awesome. She was she was there. She looked over the bike for me in the pits. She was uh, on top of everything on my water, on my uh, on the bike, on making sure I was good to go and getting me what I needed and the information I needed. So th they were all very awesome and made made it possible for me to do as well as I did. So thank you to everybody there. And thank you, sir, for letting me use your platform to thank all of them. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, it's, it's awesome to hear the story about your mom and your girlfriend. Um, because that makes ATVs really what they are. You know, you go back to the old three-wheeler racing days when it's just family. It, when you go out to, you know, the flat track races up in Campo, it's family. You know, you, you go out to a works race, you go to a, you go to even some of the District 38 races and it's just, it's, it's family, family, family. You go travel back east to a woods race. You go travel back east to a motocross race, and all you're gonna find is family, and that's what makes it so special. And so I got I got to ask this question: How did your mom handle it when she didn't know anything about desert racing? She didn't know how long it was gonna take to see you again. <laughs> how did she do? Um, better than I thought. I, I thought she was going to have a nervous breakdown before I was, but she did surprisingly well. Um, she really didn't like when the truck started passing me, that started to really freak her out. And then going into the night, uh, that really freaked her out in the, in the day she did really good. Like I said, she's not a desert, she's not a racer. She's not into desert racing. I remember one of the funniest moments to me was I came into a pit and, uh, you know, Rob fueled up the bike and was looking at the bike and, and did the once over. She got me my water and, you know, I, I got trophy trucks coming and, uh, you know, I get, I get on the bike, I get suited up and, and I'm, I'm getting ready to start it. And I look at her and she says, I saw a kangaroo mouse. It's like, awesome. Mom. I'm glad you're having a good time. That's, that's great. I, I'm going to go now. So she was in good spirits, but just, uh, I think she was very much out of her element, but uh, she did great. She, I talked to her today and recapped a little bit. She, uh, she told me about her fears of me running at night, which I, I told her, I said, I think running at night's easier as far as cars coming up on you because you go from you being the only light in the sight to you being a shadow. And that's how you know a car's behind you. Um she was she kept expect not expecting but almost wanting me to call throw in the towel throw in the towel all right i'm done let's let's load up the bike but she was very glad to see me finish um at one point uh i came into a pit i think it was pit 12 and i just came up and gave her a hug i had I had a really hard time between the two last two pits and i was uh not wanting to give up but wanting it to be over and i just gave just held on to her and she told me, she's like, I hope you never do this ever again. I said, I won't, I won't. And, and I got back on the bike and started riding. I'm like, well, you know, I, maybe, maybe next year. I won't do I won't do it again until next year. Yeah, I'll tell her that when I get back. And, you know, at the finish line, I told her, I said, you know, I, I don't, I can't say I want to do this again now, but, you know, on the drive home, I might start thinking, well, next year we could do this different. Next year we could do that different. And, so right. for first timer, she did awesome. I was very impressed. And like she was telling my girlfriend at the finish line because I was on the bike for 21 hours and I, my chase crew and I were probably up at that point for 
close to 24 hours. And my mom was telling my girlfriend, I haven't been awake this long ever. And uh, that that was funny to me. Well, you know as well as I do when you get when you get into the racing world, all nighters are a normal. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Prepping that bike, uh, I uh, especially when I had to tear it down to a bare frame the the month before, I was I was getting four hours of sleep every night over and just you know work till one or two in the morning and then get up at six for work, go work eight, 10 hours and then come home and start working on the bike again. And it was hard, but I, I knew the goal at hand and I knew, you know, giving up, what's the point of giving up? I'm going to get bored and go back out there in 10 minutes and start working on it again. So might as well just keep going and keep pushing and keep trying to achieve my dream. Right on, right on. Did you have any blisters or any problems with any portions of you? I know when you're in your gear that long, you can get blisters on your legs, you know, on your feet, on your on your on your legs, where your boots are, on your calves, things like that. Did you have any problems with any portions or any portions of you? So I baby powdered everything and corn starched everything. Um, I uh, wore these undergloves. Uh, they're like underwear material. I think that's what they're called, the underwear gloves or something like that. You can get them on, on Amazon or whatever. That made a huge difference. I had two very minor blisters on my hands. I mean, I was able to go to work the following Tuesday, and uh, that was night and day difference. Because racing down in Baja and stuff, I've not worn those, and at the end of the end of the week, your your whole hand is gone. And uh, I was very impressed. I think I destroyed them. I'm going to need another pair, but definitely worth the 20 or 30 bucks, whatever they cost to have your hands still intact. Um, my only, the night of the race, I didn't get to bed till like seven in the morning, seven thirty in the morning. And anytime I would lay down, I'd close my eyes and all I could see was me crashing and I'd wake up, you know, sh shook. And that probably went on for about, 30 minutes to an hour and I finally got to sleep slept for about an hour two hours woke up in a panic didn't know where I was didn't know what was going on my adrenaline was still pumping really high and I still had a lot of caffeine in my system and my adrenaline didn't come down till about 11 o'clock the next morning so I got about maybe three hours of sleep that day then um went to awards the next night I woke up multiple times with cramps in my arms I could you know my arms would be completely tingly, like you've been, re you know, sleeping on it wrong, but it wouldn't go away. And um, Rangel's wife helped me stretch out my arms and roll out my arms with this roll roll ball thing, and that helped. I was able to get a few more hours of sleep the next day. Um, the only thing that's still left over is I don't have any feeling in these two fingers; they are completely numb and tingly, and that hasn't gone away yet. And it's been two weeks two weeks tomorrow since the race. So I've got a little bit of carpal tunnel issues from past injuries. So that's from what I understand, that is the issue is the nerves in my wrist. So other than that, I made out pretty good. Um, I recovered fairly quickly. I went and saw uh, our acupuncturist the Tuesday after the race. And that made a huge difference. I was really impressed with that. Um, but I, I, I recover. I, bounced back fairly quickly the first two days were not great but after that i started getting better you're a kid still you're gonna recover fast well like wrangle was impressed because uh when wrangle iron man did in 21 he said he couldn't talk for like three weeks or something ridiculous like that you know he couldn't even see straight and you know and i kind of told him I said well you know i, I kind of got like 20 years on you man that that might contribute to why <laughs> Like, yeah that's fair you know, you got... in, right you know so uh that's pretty funny i that's funny. i yeah uh, i'm i'm very happy to be back at work i mean oh yeah like i said i was sore for a few days but then i think about the guy with the broken leg you know he he's not going to be going back to work for quite a while so i uh, i at the end of the day i got no problems yeah i mean it doesn't sound like it so where did the love of three-wheelers come from for you? Well, 
so it's in the blood. My uncle was uh, Bob Ace Williams. He was a pioneer of three wheeling, three wheeling back in the day. I know you've heard of him. Uh, he was a part of three B lightning and um, he pioneered a lot of the three wheelers in the late seventies and into the beginning of the eighties and had contracts from Honda to build prototypes and stuff like that. So that's, you know, it's kind of in the blood there, but growing up, I always thought three wheelers were so cool because they were dangerous and outlawed. And, you know, I grew up riding motorcycles when I was four years old and went to the desert with my father growing up my whole life. And, you know, I, I, I think the first one I ever rode was an ATC 70 and I pulled, you know, rode like a hundred feet and put my foot down and got drug off of it. And I'm never riding one of these again, ever. There's no way. And I think I was like five years old. And then later on in life, when I think I was 15 or 16, one of the friends in camp bought a, uh, 83, 84, 250R. And I tried riding that and I rode it about a hundred feet and couldn't steer and tipped it over. Like, ah, I'm going to give it one more shot. And then tried riding it and got really into it and liked it. And then, uh, when I turned 18 and got a real job and started making a little bit more money, I bought my, uh, a water cooled 250R in 85. And to see where the industry's at or where the market's at now, I paid 700 bucks for a nice, uh, running water cooled 250R, which is unheard of nowadays. That same bike could be worth 35, four grand right now. Um, more. And, yeah. And, uh, so started getting into that and just riding it out in the desert. And then I was at, uh, the, the red feather in Ocotillo and there was a big sign on the sign for three wheeler nationals. And I'm like, I went to Frank, the owner of the place and said, you know, do you think I could race in the three wheeler national? I said, no, you're gonna race in the three wheeler nationals. And my parents were all against it and no way you can't go. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go with my buddy and I'm going to watch him race, but we're going to bring my three wheeler too, just in case his breaks. And, you know, I'm there and I'm like, well, I think I'm just going to go out and ride the track and see how it goes. And then I ended up racing and I ended up doing pretty good. And, you know, my dad saw the photos of me jumping three feet in the air, four feet in the air. What happened to not racing? I just went out there and rode with the other riders. I didn't really race. And, uh, <laughs> the addiction kind of went from there and then after that i got into uh the calviumx flat track series and started building specialty flat track three-wheelers and started really getting into that and um getting into racing started racing a couple work series on the three-wheeler and uh uh azop races and then started racing with lyle tonelli and we did uh the baja 500 in 2019 and we uh had some bad luck down there and i ended up not getting on the bike we ended up dnf in the first day and then in 2021 i believe we went down for the nora 1000 and that was probably one of the coolest racing experiences in my life getting to race through mexico and um we did that again this last year and that's where I knew of Wrangle from Facebook and I knew of him from the Iron Man from Vegas Torino, but I got to, uh, become his friend or become his friend there. And me and him, you know, have, uh, gotten along real well since then and whatnot and doing, uh, Vegas Torino last year with Lyle, that was cool. And then doing it this year on my own, that was, that was a dream come true. But uh, three wheelers, I, I've always liked because they've always been the outlaw, always been, uh, you know, scary. And one thing I really like about it is anytime I pull up to a gas station with one in the back of my truck, some old timer always comes up to me. I had one of those back in the day. I had a 185. I had a 350X. I had a 250R. And I wish I didn't sell it. And my goal is to never be that guy that said, I wish I would have never sold it. So. That's uh that's kind of my whole niche with three wheelers. I can't explain it better than that, to be honest with you. So how much of the how much of the history do you know? I mean, I know we talked some I, I cut it off in the pre-conversation, 
because I didn't want to get too deep into it. But how much did you do you know of the history of the three wheeler industry and some of the things that went on, like where they think the first three wheeler race happened? So um, I wouldn't know too much about that, especially being a little bit before my time. But from what I've been told and what I've seen, I know like speed, Speedway 117 was a big part of the history. I don't know if that was necessarily where the first race was, but that's where I hear a lot of stories from my dad and see a lot of photos of my uncle Ace. And um, just that that's where I hear about a lot of things. And um, I'm trying to think of some of the other racetracks in Southern California that that would be ringing a bell. I think Saddleback is where they race some stuff for three wheelers, but Speedway 117, you know, when you go back in the, into the history books and you really dive into it, which there is no um, real written history that I'm aware of. Um, but St Speedway 117, they went out there on the nineties with the big old fat tires. And then you get, you get in with some of these guys and I still haven't remembered that one gentleman's name. And you know what? When he hears this, he's probably going to throw something at me. But um, they they, they uh, put small tires on there, golf cart tires. And that started the motocross style tire. And that happened like week three or four. And I, I, I think it was I think it was Sundall that did it first. It might not have been. Um, I, I could have it's in one of my episodes who, when we talked about it at 117, the first person to do it. And that guy ran away and destroyed everybody that day. And from then on, you know, uh, the, the modifications just kept coming and coming from suspension to, um, you know, bigger motors. And I mean, it just, it was just inevitable that, the, the three wheelers were were growing in popularity um my dad said when he brought the when they brought the one back from uh the dealer show or they got the one from the dealer show um joe phillips who was the owner of big al's racing our race team um was riding wheelies up and down the sidewalk in front of valley motorcycle sales on this three wheeler and wore the tires out but because of something like that, that sold units. <laughs> That's cool. Well, then, like any group of guys that you put together, you know, they put a big piston in it. And then they started to do this and they started to do that. So that, that I think that my dad said it lasted four or five months before they had a big piston in it. You know, so that started my dad in he was already uh, building engines for motorcycle stuff but that started his run with the atv engine building was you know the, the, those 90s and and that era from you know starting in in 69 and 70 and then rolling into the future um and then going down to speedway 117 you know because i was down there when i was a little kid uh, you know with ace and you know, Mike Davis and, the, you know, the Sundall and, and uh, Stevie Wright was down there. And, you know, that's Marty Hart came through 3B Lightning. Um, gosh, Mike Coe, Sam Coe. I mean, I can just start naming names of some of these people. And and there's guys that I, I, I can't even remember their names or I'm, you know, misplacing them. So your history of the sport that you love and the three wheelers that you love with your uncle. I mean, it, Speedway wasn't 17 and El Cajon was the place to be. I, um, I think it was, I think there was Carlsbad raceway as well. I, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, I remember hearing stories about that place too. That was a popular spot for Southern California. Carlsbad was a phenomenal place because they had, drag strips they had you know um cbs sports did a, a big freaking deal there with a um what they call like like supermoto okay today i mean they built special bikes that rode on the asphalt and the dirt um i mean it was 
Carlsbad was iconic in in the in the day because the you know the USGP was there. I mean, uh, Roger DeCoster raced there. I mean, just you, you go back, Ricky Johnson raced there. I mean, you go back, Brock Glover, and all of these names in the motorcycle industry. And we got to race our three wheelers there, um, whether it be on the motocross track or whether it was on the off road, uh, you know, doing a, a GP style race. Um, so, yeah, the, the history of that place. Um, so many people don't even remember Carlsbad. It, it's just like Glen Helen's the track now that you think about in Southern California. Well, Glen Helen's history will never dwarf what Carlsbad was, but so many people have forgotten, you know, you got to have gray hair to remember Carlsbad almost, you know? I mean, it's, it's horrible to think that, but it's true, you know? I mean, you're your true three-wheeler lovers are generally gray hairs too oh yeah yeah like i like i said anytime i pull up to a gas station it's always an old timer that these are so much fun and you know that that make a big deal out of it and anyone not anyone but uh, uh, most of the people my age or most of the people in between just don't even know what it is don't even know what they're looking at you know there are the niche crowd that are is my generation that is keeping it going and is keeping it alive but did for the most part most people into this are you know in my at least my viewpoint old timers yeah i mean david ham and his team was they're all 50 plus yeah you know and and there wasn't there's some young guys like yourself that are racing and then are doing it but you know most of the guys that are pushing it are are older um or just love three-wheelers you know like yourself uh you know, just like today, when you start looking at some of the negative things that happen in the world and the news media gets involved in a story and it's and it's bogus. And, you know, if you're standing behind the scenes, you saw what happened. And when you listen to the news, you're like, that's not at all the way it is. And, you know, some young Yahoo that worked for a news agency, unfortunately, his son was injured on a three wheeler and uh, he had clout in the in the news people i don't remember his name i can i can dig it up and i at some point would like to bring it out um you know brought up statistics fake falsified statistics um using the consumer protection agency and using uh other things that they keep track of you know for how many accidents or deaths in specific sports or indus industries. And um, at the year that they did this in 85 and 86, um, their numbers were all skewed. You know, I just can't imagine the news skewing numbers like that. The media lying to us. I just can't imagine that. <laughs> so, so when you, when you think about that, that show that came out in 85, devastated the industry and, and i don't believe that yeah it changed the evolution of the three-wheeler but what it did is it it tarnished the atv industry forever right you never got well, over yeah and, and from what i understand like that statistic that you were talking about they did the same thing 10 years later with atvs and it was no better the, the atvs didn't make it any safer and you know, now we're into the world of UTVs. And one thing I see is that you look at a lot of videos from the mid 80s of three wheelers, and you've got a 12 year old kid that weighs 85 pounds on a water cool 250R. And now their parents are wondering why he's hurt. Well, you're seeing the same thing with UTVs today. You go put a 12 year old behind the wheel of a UTV. And, you know, and then, then are you surprised when he goes and runs somebody over or, or kills somebody? It's the same exact thing. I mean, I don't want to put it down to parenting, but it's it's irresponsibility regardless. So, you know, they did a study on um, accidents and, and, and I have I have it in my other deal. But one of the biggest problems in one of the sports that I was looking up. I believe it was watercraft 
um, the biggest contributor to accidents was alcohol. And I, I believe the, that. The, the, if you look at the footage that they use in the deal, you got a guy on a three wheeler holding the beer with his chick on the back with a six pack rack and neither one of them have helmets. There's no safety gear whatsoever. And he's popping a wheelie, but he's still got that beer in his hand. And you're like, okay, well, how is, how is this the manufacturer's fault? How can you say three wheelers are unsafe when the idiot riding it is the problem? Well, you know, I mean, I know not everyone's going to agree with me and that's just fine, but it's a lot like a gun. A gun is just a piece of plastic and a metal, just like a three wheeler, you know, and I've never seen a gun pop up and hurt somebody on its own. Nope. And same with a three wheeler. I've never had one of my three wheelers jump out of the shed and come and run me down. It's nope. all on the person behind it. You know, and, and personal responsibility. When you throw your leg over, it's a dangerous sport. Yeah, absolutely. You can get hurt. So you have to be prepared for the ramification of your actions. You know, and they're trying a lot to of the generation the today is has no concept of consequences for your actions. No, and I know I am part of that generation, but I'd like to think that I uh, at least am aware of it. Hey, you know what? When you stick your hand in the fire and you burn yourself, who are you going to bitch about? You can't be <laughs> mad at the fire because the fire didn't do anything. It was you. Yeah. You know, I mean, when when you put that loaded gun on the on the desk and it sits there for 20 years and never moves, it's just a tool. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just not until a human gets involved. Yep. You know, I mean, I mean, we we can we can argue this a million different ways, and and um, trust me, I'm not a fan of the Consumer Protection Agency. I'm not a fan of uh, 60 Minutes, and MSNBC, and CBS. None of those. Uh, I believe that they're uh, evil entities that uh, have tarnished the industry that I love so much because they lie. Yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, you know. On that rabbit hole, there sometimes they lie for profit. Sometimes they lie just to manipulate. And I think in this case, they're they're almost trying to ruin an industry, and uh, they do that just because someone somewhere somehow benefits from it financially or politically or power trip or however it works. I mean, I think that's a lot of where our news comes from today that it's all a matter of power and control. You know, it doesn't matter of what happened. It doesn't matter of how it happened. It's a matter of what, how can we manipulate this to control the masses or influence the masses or in a lot of the cases, scare the masses. Right. And I, I don't know how it relates to that with this scenario, other than you have an individual who felt that they were wronged uh, because their child got injured on a, on a three-wheeler um, that probably wasn't old enough or big enough or strong enough to ride the unit that he was on. But that's neither here nor there. That's that comes back to, unfortunately, and, and this is just the story that I read. He was at his grandfather's farm and he had ridden the machine before. And what I'm assuming is he got cross rutted in a rain rut and threw him on the ground and broke his arm. And it, it was a little more severe injury than just a broken arm. But that's the gist of what I got out of the article or the depth that I could get into it. And um, some of the other things that I got to read and some of the other people they interviewed, um, just no awareness of what they were doing. You know? I mean, yeah, I believe that. You know, we've always been told that it's dangerous. You can get hurt. Hey, go ride a bicycle, dude. You, you mountain bike at all? No. I, I, I uh, raced BMX bikes for a long time. Well, how many scabs and scars you got from that? I can't count that high. <laughs> See? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. So, you know, uh, I, I read a deal about equestrian 
88% of the people that ride equest equestrian get injured. Yeah. Well, 88%. Yeah, the, the thing is, is there's no one to sue over a horse hurting you. Oh, there's somebody to sue always, you know. But, that, I mean, we live, in, we live in California, dude. You, you can sue a turnip. You, you, you live in California. I moved to America. I live in Arizona now. <laughs> Oh, nice. Well, it's it's kind of hazy over there. It's not as red as it used to be. Yeah, I, yeah, but you know, I I get that. I have seen that, and you know, I have had the people look at me. Where are you from? And you kind of Cal California. They give you funny looks, and I I ha I've started telling them I'm a political refugee of California. And well, they get it. You're a smart man. You're a smart man. Um. You know, we have ties here in California and it's the, the business was started here in mm -hmm. California. Um, dad's still here. And um, I mean, I just don't see at this time, I just don't see us being able to up and up and move the whole, whole kit and caboodle to Arizona or Nevada or, or someplace that's, that's more convenient. And my family's from Mexico, so, or a portion of my family, the other half of my family is from Mexico, and they kind of want to stay close to the border as well, or stay, make it easy access, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. Um, so that that's also a leading deal with, with my family and where my wife and I will end up. But that's, that's a whole nother story. You know, it's not as much fun to talk about that as it is to talk about three wheelers and 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 racing. Um, you talked about next year and possibly doing Vegas to Reno. What about some of the flat track stuff? Are you still riding flat track bikes? Yes, I um, I had to kind of put the flat track on pause for getting ready for this, just financially and just being focused on getting the bike ready, but um. I plan on prepping prepping my tri -Z. I've got an 85 tri -Z that I have lowered and set up completely for flat track. It is a permanent flat track bike. And I've got a Banshee that's lowered that you guys actually helped me get set up. And it's set up for flat track. So um, next month, I'm trying, I think September 23rd weekend, that might be right. Somewhere in there, they uh, were running flat track out at Campo. Um, the girlfriend, her boy, her little boy, He's uh, got a go-kart that he runs. We've been taking him out and running that, but I haven't been racing. But this next coming race, I'll be out there racing both the Banshee and my Tri-Z. Um, awesome. Last, I think, uh, not last year, but the four years before that, I was uh, the three-wheeler points champion there uh, four years in a row. And I think maybe two years I was quad, maybe just one year. But um, I want to start getting back into that. I kind I kind of lost my luster. A lot of people stopped coming out, and there would be times where I was the only three wheeler, and it's not motivating to race yourself. But we're starting to see some new faces, some new blood come out, and that's starting to get me excited. So hopefully, as you know, we can start building the sport up a little bit more again, both quads and three wheelers. Um, I'm hoping to shoot to have five or six three wheelers show up. Uh, next round this coming round and maybe about the same amount of quads so that that makes it a lot more fun to go racing when you have some competition oh yeah i'm sure it does you know that, that, that always makes it a lot more fun you know you're trying to have a good time and and there's nobody there you know oh yeah yeah it, you know it, it's yeah it's cool going out there and getting first place but not when there's no one trying to chase you down are you going to do any more of the AZOP stuff or anything like that with the uh, more of the off-road style racing? Um, I'd like to. Um, I, I'd i like to do some more works races and more uh, AZOP. I've also looked into like the Vora the uh, out in Nevada. I know it's kind of a long stretch, but it is some of the fewer long distance three-wheeler racing are still available a lot of places don't allow it um 
Uh, I, I probably the next big race will be the Nora 1000. Um, I, uh, I always look forward to that every year. It should be a good time. I, uh, I would, I am considering, depending on the turnout of three wheelers for next Vegas Torino, maybe not doing Vegas Torino and seeing about, seeing if I can get into score and do like the Baja 500 or the Baja 400. Um, I know that's a little more hairy, but I think it, it's definitely on the bucket list to go do a Baja 500. I was, I thought threw around the idea in my mind just playing with it doing the thousand but when i got to the end of vegas to reno i thought about it okay turn around and ride back that's the thousand it's like no nah, 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 that, that's that's a little too much above me right now but um i, don't I uh, necessarily think that you should do a point to point um iron man um maybe a loop thousand that's only 600 or 700 miles maybe that would be a little more reasonable um especially if i built myself up a little bit better got in better shape got more mentally prepared for a 700 mile race 500 miles i did really good at vegas torino till about mile 400 that's when i started really getting tired that's also when i started having tire issues and then that started taking a lot out of me because then I was two hours behind on schedule, just having to ride slow and fight the bike. And, you know, it just made everything more difficult. Um, but I think if that went smooth, I, I would have held out a little bit longer. Definitely in uh, Vegas Serena, the last 40 miles took everything out of me that I had left. If I, if I was at 80% drained. I was zero when I was riding across the finish line at five miles an hour, puff, puffing and puffing. It was really gnarly train, but I know with Baja, there have some gnarly train, especially from what I've seen outside San Felipe, it can get real whooped out and rocky and bad around there. I know some of the Southern area is a little bit smoother, more truck trail, less ridden out, but um, I, I would agree like, Really, the next one from the pit point to point backwards, I guess it's about to be 1,300 miles. So it would be like doing Vegas to Reno and then back to Vegas and then halfway back again, plus 100 miles. And right. uh, it makes me want to throw up just thinking about it. <laughs> so if you go back and race the desert, are you going to put a – are you thinking about tire inserts, like tire blocks? I – would love to, but they they are pricey. If I can get ahead of funds enough, I definitely would. But from what I understand, for like uh, some of my buddies that are sponsored by them and still get them at discount, they're five hundred dollars to put on all three three wheels. Um, I don't know if there's any other uh, options out there other than like slime, which uh, I've had good luck with that in the past. I ordered some for this race and it didn't show up in time, but most of my, uh, most of my flats were giant holes in the tire or in the sidewall that I don't think slime would have helped it. It helped a lot in Mexico going across cactuses and picking up cactus needles and stuff. The slime worked really good there, but I think for what I had, they were total blowouts. Um, tire blocks. I've heard good things about. I know some of the other guys were running them and had flats and still were able to run at speed. Um, it's just hard for me to justify spending $500 to $1,000 if you want a backup set. And, you know, if you pop one, you're, they're destroyed. They're trash. From what I understand about them, I, I'm just not on that level yet that I can start justifying that kind of money. I understand, but, man – not having to change a tire and being able to keep and continue on. Um, it changed the dynamic for racing in the desert for the ATVs, especially at some of the pro levels, like when I was building machines for that, because we were no longer worried. We would run one set of tires for the entire race. 
and just not worry about it. And if you had one break down and it got to where it was an issue, then you would change one. But most of the time they were living for the long races, the short races. And, and um, I think Parker was the worst on, on them because there was so much rock that it destroyed the, 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 the block inside because we would gouge the tire instantly and they would just, beat it to death and at the end of the race yeah the blocks are done the tires done but you finished without having to change and you didn't destroy the bike that's fair and what what, what also gave me a a sense of confidence or maybe even a false sense of confidence is with tonelli uh racing for him we did the thousand both years and vegas torino and didn't have a single flat so that gave me the false sense of confidence. I don't need him. I won't have a flat. We haven't had a flat yet. Well, I made up for lost time on that one. We raced Vegas Arena one year and went through 22 tires. On a bike? A quad. A quad? 22 wow. tires. Yeah. That's crazy. Destroy. Borrowing tires, destroying them. And then, you know, the next year, one tire how do you figure yeah i i, I destroyed a, a borrowed tire and rim mike burson that uh let me borrow his i destroyed it and at the end of the weekend i signed it to him thanks for the loaner and uh sent him a new tire tire and rim and did just one of those like part, part of the part of it part of racing part of destroying equipment you know you don't go drag it through the dirt and rocks and expect it to come out okay Right. But uh, back to your question, I, I would love to do tire blocks. It's just financially out of my means right now. It, it is on the list, but it's a little bit lower on the list. There are other things on it, but um, maybe I'll even apply for a sponsorship for next year. See, see what they can come up with for me. Well, if you need a good word, let me know. I know Kenny, the owner, and uh, I'll, be, I'll put a good word in it. We're, good word in for you if you need it. You know, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You guys all need as much help as you can get. That brings me to one more question is, have you thought about, you know, doing a uh, conversion on suspension? I know that you like the old school platform, but upgrading to newer style suspension is always a plus with a three wheeler. I didn't, I'm not saying go to a hybrid. I'm just talking about possibly going to one of the conversion upgrade front ends, uh, maybe upgrading a rear shock or a linkage system, you know, because I've heard people putting different swing arms on them and go into a more modern modern linkage. Have you thought about doing anything like that? So currently on the bike, I've got a uh, TRX 450 06 and ups rear swing arm. Um, and I've got a original shock. I'm working with San Diego small engines right now. They're working on getting me a 450 aftermarket shock. I don't, I don't remember what brand it is, but it, it has a remote resi. So it'll work on my bike. Um, that I believe depending on the shock configuration will get me a little bit more travel. I've ridden, um, a bike, a 250 R with the, uh, converted front end, the upside down forks. And I was really, really unhappy. It felt like it added a 20 pound weight to the front of the bike. It uh, cracked the frame within three days of racing it. Um, from what I understand about and what makes sense to me with the uh, original forks, they do allow a little bit of flex and play in the bike and they do flex. And that doesn't happen with the converted forks and that flex gets absorbed into the frame and starts cracking frames and i saw that for myself and like trying to do wheelies and get the front end up over things it just was a lot harder with the upside down forks so you see no benefit in that i, I it seems like you would have a lot more ability to adjust your suspension i've got the um i've got the i think it's race tech gold valves in the front right now and I, that made a huge difference. That was night and day over the shock pogo sticks. And um, I, 
I've thought about trying to make my own setup out of a lighter front end out of like lighter, maybe smaller, like 80 shot, 80 forks. But for me to pay somebody to go do all the machining for me, it's just a little out of my financial league. The day when the day comes that I have my own shop and my own lathe and mill, then I might start messing with it when it's only when it's just my hours, not someone else's hours that I got to pay for. Understood. Understood. I mean, hey, dude, that's how we're that's how we all started racing was was doing it ourselves and figuring it out and and spending the least amount of money um, because there was no money, you know, and, you know, we've raced for the love of the sport like you are in the back of the pickup truck, you know, you know, sometimes with no easy up, sometimes with, you know, a tarp, whatever we could get, you know, in a cooler with a sandwich in it and a, and some water to, to, to drink. And that was it. That was all there was, you know, it's funny you say that. Cause it, it it's a trip to me, just how life develops. Cause I remember being 17, 18 and going and throwing my dirt bike in the bed of my truck on a Friday and going and buying three bean and cheese burritos and throwing them in my truck and driving to the desert. And I would spend 50 bucks on a desert trip and go out there and spend the night in the bed of my truck for, you know, two or three weekends or two or three days and spend, you know, meet my friends out there and, you know, would make a trip out of, you know, 50 bucks. Now it's like, it's 300 bucks in diesel just to get my rig to the desert and, you know, then now you, now you're playing with race gas. Now that ain't cheap. And, you know, it just, it's funny now a, a, a decent desert weekend is a four or $500 weekend, but more. you're also playing with bigger, badder toys. Right. Right. I totally get it, man. It, when you, as you get older, it doesn't get cheaper. Oh yeah. And you don't want to sleep on the, you don't, you're not going to sleep in the bed of the truck anymore. So, so I mean, I get it. Cause I'm, I'm not going to go unless I got a bed and a shower. Yeah. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. And, you know, I have a, my wife is gracious enough to make sure that we have a nice motor home and, and um, that's what we go places in and do things in. And, and it's because of her. I, I mean, I probably wouldn't have a nice motor home without her. And, and I probably wouldn't uh, go some of these places because I don't have it. So I'm not going to go. Um, you know, I, I, I get it, you know, gray hair, gray hair or a little bit of age comes with more comfort. Um, I was talking to one of the guys from uh, clean desert and uh, we were talking about, you know, making sure that we have all the amenities, <laughs> you know, it, it's just not any fun anymore. I already roughed it. I went through that phase, you know? Well, like the way I justify it in my head and to my buddies is, yeah, I spent $500 to get out here, but I don't have to, climb out of the bed of my truck and go find a bush, you know, when it's 40 degrees and 30 mile an hour winds at two in the morning, all I got to do is go, you know, five feet in my heated mo in my heated toy hauler. Yep. Yep. And you're comfortable and, you know, his girlfriend's happy and, you know, since she has a little boy then he's more comfortable, you know, if you have pets, they're comfortable, you know, it's a home on wheels. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome, brother. Hey, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know that you're a busy guy and, you know, we we had a little bit of uh, trouble getting us together, but we we did it and uh, we got it handled. And I and I thank you so much for telling your story. It, it really means a lot. To John. The team here at ATV Talk would love your feedback. Please email us at hello at ATVTalkPodcast.com. If you're in need of a consultation for your current racing program, a custom ATV, or an industry guest speaker, I have the company for you. Duncan Technologies International Inc. offers host, MC, and guest speaking services at events. Builds custom ATVs for recreational riding or racing around the world. And they offer consulting services for professional teams or individual racers. Send inquiries to Duncan Tech International at gmail.com or call 619 716 1532 for more information. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 
If you did, don't forget to share us with your family and friends. The podcast is available on all streaming platforms, and you can find us on social media as ATV Talk Podcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. 